Welcome to another edition of Inside the War Room. Ryan Ray here, as always, and a special guest today, uh, Senator Ted Cruz. And uh, Senator, before I bring you on, I want to thank your staff who has worked with me for, I look back, I met one of your staffers uh, at a meeting with some African ambassadors last February, which kind of started mm. this whole process. And then I've been working with your lovely press secretary since I think about May. So uh, Excellent. Just, uh, thank you for setting this up um, and finally get to do this. So thank you for your time and thank them for setting this up. Well, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Okay. What originally interested me about bringing you on was the China issue. I'm on the George H.W. Bush Foundation for uh, U.S. China Relations. And mm-hmm. we were talking about China last year. You had some concerns about the movie industry and China. And obviously, you've expressed other problems about China. Uh, where do we sit today? What is your biggest concern about China? Well, I think China poses the most significant geopolitical threat uh, to our country and to the world really for the next century. Uh, if, if you look at, at China, China is executing a whole of government strategy uh, for, for nothing less than world domination. They're looking for military domination, economic domination, cultural domination. And, and if you look at how they, they carry that out, they carry that out through a host of means. Number one, the, the Chinese government, the communist government, is murderous and oppressive. If you look at how they treat their own citizens, uh, they have concentration camps with Uyghurs, over a million Uyghurs, a religious minority in China in concentration camps. They're subject to torture, they're subject to murder. Uh, They engage in in a horrific repressive regime where they monitor their citizens and they punish them uh, if, if they dare defy the state if they dare disagree with the state. And if you look at how they conduct foreign policy and national security policy, uh, the Chinese government engages in theft, the theft of intellectual property as a state policy. So we've always dealt with espionage, corporate espionage. That's always been part of, as long as there's been ideas being developed, there have been people stealing those ideas. We have never had a multi-trillion dollar nation state investing systematically in the theft of intellectual property. So to to give an example, um, in October, year before last, I I did a a tour of Asia where I traveled to Pearl Harbor, to Japan, to Taiwan, to India, and to Hong Kong. And and it was designed to be very much a, a friends and allies tour. It was allies of America, all surrounding China, all dealing with the increased aggressiveness of China. And Pearl Harbor, uh, I met with the the leadership of our Pacific Command who described just how much of our military technology the Chinese government has stolen through intellectual property theft and recreated without having to invest in the R&D to develop it in the first place. They do that in the military side, they do that in technology, they do that in the commercial side. Uh, They engage in rampant propaganda. Across the country, we have what are called Confucius Institutes that are opened in US universities. They are owned and controlled by the Chinese government. They engage in propaganda and espionage. We have things like Huawei, which which is is styled as a giant telecom company. But in fact, what it is, is a government spy agency. And they install telecom equipment designed to engage in, to intercept communications and to steal communications from their rivals. All of this, China is fighting, and, and by the way, In the midst of this COVID crisis, one of our real areas of vulnerability was especially highlighted, the degree to which our supply chain, China has systematically targeted our supply chain. It has gone after critical industries and they do this as a matter of government policy. So we discovered as the the COVID pandemic expanded that there were a host of medicines that, that, that were produced exclusively in China. And they were threatening to cut off America's supply of life-saving medicines as a tool of economic warfare um, they've done the same thing with rare earth minerals, where they target, they with government subsidies, slash prices to bankrupt every other producer and to drive American producers out of business. And they do it to have a stranglehold on the American economy. And so for the eight years I've been in the Senate, I've been systematically trying to lay out the scope of the threat from China and also the multiple tools and avenues we need to employ to, to, to deal with that threat. So. Let's, let's unpack that, the, the theft angle for a second. One of the yeah. frustrations I have from big corporations is, is they complain about the theft. But if you go back to the history of companies going to China, they understood the deal. And the deal was, you're going there, 
you're going to work with them, you know, even like Disney, uh, Disneyland Shanghai or whatever it's called, you know, 53% or whatever it is, is owned by the local government. These companies go there, they understand that they are going to lose their IP through this process. And then they come back and complain to the American people saying, oh, no, you know, we're getting stolen from. Now, they do have legitimate espionage, but our big business plays a big hand in this as well. And so how do you yeah. how do we handle that? Because as a free market capitalist, I don't want to see the government just you know, sanctioning or, or fighting these companies, but also I get a little perturbed at the hypocrisy. Well, look, you're right that, that big business is, is very much in bed with China. Um, big tech is overwhelmingly in bed with China. Uh, big Hollywood is completely in bed with China. You look at things like the NBA. The NBA uh, looks at China as 1.3 billion potential consumers. They look at it as hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, and they are utterly unwilling to say or do anything. You know, you remember back to, to Daryl Morey at the Rockets, who sent a really mild tweet, uh, stand for freedom, stand for democracy in Hong Kong. And number one, the Chinese government lost their minds. President Xi, it shows just how vulnerable they are, that, that look, I'm, I'm a Houstonian and a diehard Rockets fan, so I knew who Daryl Morey was, but I guarantee you most people on planet Earth did not uh, until China reacted like like a terrified screaming child that he he dared tweet that and then we saw the nba just fall all over itself groveling to apologize to china uh because and it's all about the, it's all about the benjamins it's all about money um you know the nba was had a, a training center by the uyghur concentration camps where they were beating uh, Uyghur teenagers mm -hmm. um, and, and the NBA, they will not say one critical word. You had LeBron James coming out and praising China, saying, oh, Daryl Morey doesn't understand. Uh, you know, look, I got to say, my, my family's from Cuba. My Tia Sonia was imprisoned and tortured by Castro and communist goons. I understand fully well that communists are murdering, torturing thugs and and it is a real problem that much of big business has decided there's money to be made there. Now, you're right. As a free market person, I'm not going to prohibit that. Uh, but, but we are going to look for policies to make sure that the decisions that big business make doesn't leave the United States national security vulnerable. So, for example, rare earth minerals. I've introduced a bill called the ORAC that creates strong tax incentives for mining and developing rare earth in minerals that are critical for uh, defense technology, that are critical for just high tech components because China has systematically bankrupted most of the producers of rare earth minerals, which means they have essentially a monopoly on it. And that is dumb for America to be vulnerable. The same is true with pharmaceuticals. It makes no sense that the lives of millions of Americans is de are dependent upon the good graces of the Chinese dictator. During, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, one of the Chinese state controlled newspapers explicitly advocated, let's cut off their medicines, let's let them die. Uh, that, that, that's unacceptable. And so again, we can do a lot of it, not through a prohibition. I'm not interested in banning American companies from doing business with China. If they wanna do that, they can, but we can create strong tax incentives for ensuring we have uh, the critical supply capacity here in the United States so that our national security is not left vulnerable. Yeah, one quick comment on the Daryl Morey thing. We've talked about that on Feeding the Dragon podcast extensively. And for me, the Tillman Fertitta coming out immediately saying, oh, he doesn't speak for us. I've heard Daryl Morey on the Dan Patrick Show countless times talking about Houston Rockets back when he was the GM. And to me, it shows that uh, Fertitta, who pretends to be this big, tough business guy, is, is ultimately you know, isn't the big tough business guy that he, pretend, he pretends to be. So I, I, I found that kind of hilarious at how quick that they were able to um, to backtrack. So um, can we pause for a second and say, what is happening to Houston sports? It seems like every team is on fire oh. and, and collapsing in this gorge. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm horrified watching it. That was the only thing your, your press secretary said I couldn't bring up was how bad Houston sports were. They said that was I, off limits. <laughs> I, I have no defense. I'm just... Uh, and what is this now? Okay, there's a weird practice. So first of all, the Texans just waved J.J. Watt, mm -hmm. one of the greatest defensive players in history, the face of the franchise, Hall of Fame player. Okay, I guess J.J. was unhappy. He's going to go play somewhere else. But they didn't even trade him for anyone. They didn't even get a water boy. They just said, okay, bye. 
and and then just you know the Rockets are now waving Bo- Boogie Cousins. I, I liked how Boogie's been playing, but all right, if they want to go somewhere else, again they just wave him. Has nobody ever heard of trading to to, to get another player? I I do not understand what's happening, but it's. Uh, I will remain a diehard Houston fan, but they're making it tough right now. <laughs> they are making it tough. They are making it tough. Um, one final thing on China, and we'll move on. When I look at China, there, there's kind of three – okay, there's a lot of issues, but I kind of bolt into three. You have Hong Kong, you have yeah. the Uyghurs, as you mentioned, and you have Taiwan. And so um, we've had Joshua Wong on this podcast before, who's now in jail, sadly. Uh, we've had someone on top of the Uyghurs. Uh, we haven't had a Taiwan Taiwanese expert on, but that's next. From my perspective, Taiwan is kind of the, the one spot the U.S. should be ready to intervene. The other two are terrible and they're tough, but we, we, we need to talk about them. We need to figure out how to put pressure on them, but – I don't think we can really do a whole lot from where we're at. Would you agree with that uh, scenario, uh, that synopsis? Uh, not, no, no, I, w- I think we can do things on all three. Um, I agree that all three are very important. Let's, let's start with Taiwan, because I think that's, that's where you started in there. I, I mentioned October 2019, I was in Taiwan. I was actually there on their national day where they, they celebrate uh, the independence and formation of Taiwan. And it was the first time a, a U.S. senator had been there on their national day in, in 34 years. So it was with, with President Tsai as they're having parades, as they're celebrating. And, and I went there very deliberately. Um, look, it pissed the Chinese government off. Actually, when President Tsai came, came to the United States, she came to Houston and I met with her in Houston. And, and the Chinese government before the meeting sent me a letter requesting that I not meet with President Tsai. <laughs> and, and, and I had great fun responding to the government of China and, and, and essentially saying piss off. <laughs> uh, saying, saying, look, I don't purport to tell you with whom you may meet, and I am quite certain you are not able to tell me with whom I will meet. Mm. Uh, and so I, I, we did the meeting in Houston, and, and, and I think, so Taiwan and Hong Kong pose existential threats to China. Why is that? Because in both instances, you have people who are ethnically Chinese, who, who they're population in terms of the demographics, in terms of the composition of the population is is virtually indistinguishable from mainland China, but they have enjoyed free enterprise and and the citizens of Taiwan, the citizens of Hong Kong have enormous prosperity. The standard of living is much, much greater. They have freedom, they have free speech, they're able to engage. and, And it is a daily reminder. Look, the reason President Xi is terrified of Taiwan and Hong Kong is he doesn't want 1.3 billion Chinese citizens saying, hey, wait a second, how come they get to be prosperous and provide for their family and have good lives and have freedom and we're stuck in captivity um, and poverty and misery? And, and that's what communism has produced over and over and over again, wherever it's been implemented and forced on the people is poverty and suffering and misery. And, and so I think it's really important to highlight it's why they're trying to crush Hong Kong I've authored legislation to, to increase sanctions on China for going after Hong Kong. I've also authored legislation to impose sanctions on Chinese officials going after the Uyghurs. And so I think we can use sanctions and economic pressure. There's other things we can do. So for example, uh, Taiwan, uh, under the Obama administration, they implemented a rule that, you, that the Taiwanese government could not display in the US the Taiwanese flag. They couldn't have symbols of the state because we operate under this weird fiction called a one China policy that we just pretend China doesn't exist or Taiwan doesn't exist. What? Taiwan, never seen it. Nope, don't know it's there. Um, I think that fiction doesn't make any sense. And so I've introduced legislation to allow the Taiwanese government officials to display their flag, by the way, to allow the Taiwanese military to wear their uniforms um, it's not clear what the Biden administration is going to do on that front. I sat down with Tony Blinken, the new Secretary of State, and pressed him on uh, ensuring that Taiwan can display their flag and their military uniforms. We'll see, although I'll say I am very, very concerned just a month into it that already the Biden administration is making a hard pivot towards China and towards an embrace of communist China. And, and, and so I, I, I'm not terribly optimistic that they're going to be prepared to stand with Taiwan or stand with Hong Kong. Well, I'll say this. We will be covering the Taiwan issue on this podcast. So anyone listening who's from Taiwan government is welcome because 
I I agree. I think the one China policy is is silly. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I'm not sure I have a better solution. I think that's a bad policy. The other thing I'll say is I was pleased to hear Joe Biden call the CCP xenophobic the other day in his town hall with CNN. I thought that kind of got overlooked compared to some of the other things he said for what that's worth. Um, Let's talk about some energy stuff. Obviously, that's uh, here in Texas where I live, where you live. That's a big deal. Um, Not only in Texas have we seen the energy policy from the Biden administration have its impact. We've seen it across the U.S. with the Keystone Pipeline. Um, You know, um, my co-host, Ellen Wald, on the Energy Week podcast brought up this point is that how can American companies, you know, if if our policy is going to change every four years or every eight years, you know, how can we expect companies to build and to invest in the big, long pipeline projects, big projects that that, that take a lot of capital resources? Um, How do we, you know, how could you encourage companies to do that if you can't promise them more than a four-year leadway? Yeah, look, it's it's a real problem. It, it you know, energy didn't used to be as politicized as it is right now. So so there was always some regulatory uncertainty, but the position of today's Democratic Party on energy is is really bizarre. It it, it is not based on reason or facts or logic or science. It's interesting. The Democrats like to say they're the party of science, but but when it comes to energy, everything they do is based on emotion and hate. So they hate oil and gas. They hate coal. And they start from the proposition that carbon-based energy is bad, it is immoral, and it is going to destroy all life on planet Earth. And therefore, every policy they have is based on wanting to kill as many jobs and energy as possible and to eliminate all carbon-based energy production. Now, Will there come a time in the future when we're not relying on oil or gas or coal? Sure, I I fully expect at some point in the future we will have alternative energy sources. You look at the history of industrial development throughout mankind and we've gone through multiple different eras of energy sources, whether wood burning fires, whether kerosene, whether steam, there have been different eras where different energy sources were, were dominant. And, and nobody expects that the status quo will remain the case forever. Mm. Um, I don't know when that is. I don't know if that is 10 years from now, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, or 300 years from now. Um, and it's going to depend upon the technological innovation and, and progress moving forward. But when you look at their policies, all right, let's take something like the Keystone Pipeline. So on day one, Joe Biden signs an order banning the Keystone Pipeline. With the stroke of a pen, 11,000 jobs disappear. 8,000 of those were union jobs. So there are 8,000 union members whose jobs, Joe Biden has said, your jobs don't matter. Feeding your kids doesn't matter. Your jobs are gone. Um, So I think that is really bad and really dumb. What are the consequences of it? Well, the consequences of it, number one, it's not like the oil being produced in the tar sands in Alberta. They're suddenly going to stop producing it. instead of putting it in a pipeline, they are transmitting that oil by rail, which is much more dangerous environmentally, much more prone to a spill, much more prone to hurting the environment. So they justify this as we love the environment so much, but this is where I say their policies are not remotely connected to science or evidence or facts, because what they mandate is worse for the environment. And by the way, to the extent the Biden administration succeeds, in it destroying the American oil and gas industry. And I think that is their objective, is to put out of business everyone in domestic energy production. It's not like tomorrow your car is going to stop needing gasoline. It's not like your truck is going to stop needing gasoline. So if we're not producing in the Permian, if we're not producing in the Eagleford, if we're not producing in America, uh, what it will mean is we will import much more oil from the Middle East. We will import much more oil from foreign countries where, number one, they produce the energy much dirtier than we do. Number two, it's sending billions of dollars to regimes led by leaders who hate us. Giving Vladimir Putin billions of dollars is a really bad idea from the national security perspective uh, of our country. And I'd much rather it be American jobs hundreds of thousands of high paying jobs producing that energy rather than billions of dollars going to nations that want to kill us. And so their policies, they're not based on let's have a reasonable, and and by the way, everyone agrees 
that we should be fighting pollution and protecting the environment. I mean, that you know, they they frame this as they're, they're these great moralizers. They don't acknowledge that their policies are hurting the environment. So if you actually cared about the environment, you would not do what they were doing. But they also don't acknowledge. So you know this, and, and I suspect many of the, the, the viewers of your podcast know this, but last year, what nation had the single greatest reduction in carbon emissions of every nation on planet Earth? The answer is the United States, by far. What drove that? The single biggest factor that drove that was the substitution of natural gas electricity generation for coal electricity generation. Producing electricity from natural gas is much cleaner for the environment. That was driven by fracking. That was driven by oil and gas entrepreneurs that are massively reducing pollution. Is the left happy about that? No, they wanna put them out of business and move us in a direction. And by the way, China continues building coal-fired plants polluting like crazy. And the Biden administration wants to do nothing about it and just destroy American jobs. It makes zero sense. Okay, we have just a few bits here. So let me see if I can get through these next couple pretty quickly. Um, one of the things I have put out there is if you look at Colorado or Washington, they've legalized drugs. And what they've basically said to the feds is, you know, we're going to kind of do our own thing here. You guys stay out of our business. Should the industry, in, energy industry in Texas consider doing the same thing or other energy industry states say, you know what, we don't need FERC approval for everything we do. We're going to do our own thing and you guys kind of stay out of our business. You know, I don't know that that that's a complicated question legally. Um, I'm certainly interested in in any creative solutions to press back on on the Green New Deal assault on jobs, and 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 it's assault not just on on millions of high paying jobs in energy, but also in manufacturing. You look at uh, the last few years, we saw a boom in manufacturing driven by low cost energy. It enables us to compete with foreign countries like China, not based on low cost labor, we don't want to compete on that front, but based on low cost abundant energy, it lets us bring the kind of blue collar union jobs that, that formed, formed the backbone of the American middle class. Those jobs had been hemorrhaging this country. They come back with low cost energy. And so I think we ought to be defending jobs. And in terms of what the energy industry should be doing, I'll tell you one of the things that I think the energy industry desperately needs to do is show up to the argument. Mm. I mean, right now it is so wildly one-sided. You look at our schools, Heidi and I have two girls who are, who are 10 and 12. They go to school in Houston. Every day, what they learn in school is oil and gas are bad. I mean, it, it is a relentless political message that is being taught. And that's in Houston, Texas. So what do you think they're teaching in San Francisco if that's what they're teaching in Houston? And the energy industry, we're not defending ourselves. We're not engaged in the debate over, over the Green New Deal. We're not engaged in any of the debate. I think a lot of the big energy companies, that their approach is essentially they want to feed the alligator, hoping he'll eat them last. And, and if we don't, Margaret Thatcher famously said, first you win the argument, then you win the vote. We've got to engage based on facts, based on science, based on substance and make our objectives clear. We want prosperity, we want abundance, we want lots and lots of jobs, and we want a cleaner environment. We're on the right side, and, and there is virtually no one arguing and arguing effectively in a way that, that, that people are hearing and understanding. Okay, we got less than 60 seconds, so we'll run through this quickly. First off, I do agree, which is why we have the Texas Oil and Gas Podcast, the Indrik Podcast, yes. to get that, so we thank you for coming on those programs. Um, two things. Um, first, when your Houston Texans take the field in September, should the stadium be at whatever capacity they can sell to? And follow up, I asked my kids, I have four, uh, I said, what question would you ask Ted Cruz? And my 11-year-old daughter would like to know, what is your favorite thing to get from Sonic of all things? So I'll leave you those two questions. All right. On the first one, look, it, it should be at a pretty high capacity. I mean, we'll see where, where the pandemic is, although as more and more people get vaccinated, Hopefully we will overcome this, this pandemic. I got to say, it's been pretty nutty watching sporting events where you have a 20,000 or 50,000 or 80,000 person stadium empty. Um, I, I'm glad at least to see stadiums partially full, but, but we ought to have them reasonably full depending on the state of the pandemic. We shouldn't have this sort of artificial nobody there. It, it's weird. Um, you know, I was at the... Uh, SEC championship game between uh, Alabama and Florida. And it was, I think, at 25% capacity. It's just weird 
to be at a football game where they're piping in fake cheering and you're kind of looking around at all these empty chairs and being like, all right, this is, this is kind of nuts. Uh, favorite thing at Sonic, a chili cheese dog. Okay. I will pass it along. Senator Cruz, thank you so much for your time. Thank your staff as well for setting us up. We'd love to get you back on. And it's always good to get uh, the big politicians on the little shows. So we thank you so much for doing that for us today. Well, thank, thanks for what you're doing. And thank you for focusing on, on substance and, and common sense.